Ethical hacking may seem like an oxymoron, but having someone that you trust do a penetration test on your network may shock you. Our guest today has been helping people for 20 years to know when they're vulnerable, and he shares his stories and insights to help you keep your information secure. Today's guest is Brian Self. Brian is a certified information systems security professional, ethical hacker, and professional speaker. He has the unique ability to take a complicated topic like network security and make it easy for a wide audience to understand. He has been in information security for over 15 years and IT for over 20. He is a professional penetration tester doing offensive security, compliance subject matter expert, IT security architect, security engineer, and a consultant in a variety of security domains. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. Great. So can you give me a background of how you got involved in cybersecurity? Because I know you've been in IT for, what, 20 years? I I claim 20, but it's showing my age if I tell how long (laughs) I've really been in the industry. Really where I started, years and years ago, I started doing desktop support and realized, you know, doing the PC tech stuff was pretty fun and realized that, you know, as a PC tech, we kind of got into things we shouldn't get into. And I started getting kind of catching the security bug. It's like, well, what happens if? And just asking what if a lot. And next job, I became a server administrator, you know, kind of moving up in the world in the IT world. And I remember I came into work. I was working at, well, I'm here, I'm here in Colorado and there's a, we'll just say local brewery that I worked for. Uh, one of the larger ones, I'll, I'll give, give that much away at least. And I went into work one day and my boss, he caught me before I could get to my cube. And he says, hey, We've got some people running around. It's okay. You you can let them go into the data center. If they need to use your machine, you can even let them use your machine. They're doing what's called a a pen test for us. And, of course, you know, I was like sitting there clicking my pen. I was like, a pen? He's like, no, 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 penetration test, P-E-N, not P-I-N. And it's like, oh, okay, still doesn't make much sense, but fine, whatever. And I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I'm, yeah, I, just a system administrator. Nobody's going to want to use my machine. I go back to my cube. There's somebody standing there waiting to use my machine. And he's like, yeah, can I use your machine? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. And I reach in real quick and I lock the keyboard because, you know, I wasn't doing security good practice and I left it open. So I, you know, my keyboard's open. I close it real quick and he just looks at me like whatever. And he sits down, looks up at the board to see what my name is and, and kind of looks up in the air like he's remembering something types in my username, smiles at me, moves out of the way, and types in my password, like letter by letter. And I'm oh. just like, uh, uh, you're not supposed to know that. And he's like, well, true, I'm not. And hits enter and gets in. And, and I'm just like, okay, okay, how, how, what, why, what, who are you? And he, he proceeds to tell me I'm ethical hacker. And I was like, okay, that seems like an oxymoron, ethical and hacking, okay. And he, and he tells me, you know, he's been doing it for years, and in like 15 to 20 minutes, he shows me more about the network and the systems than I had explored when I being there for like a year and a half. And like in this 15 minutes, I'm like, what is that? What's this? What's that? I was hooked. I From that point on, I was like, yeah, I want to do what he does. And so, you know, I spent quite a bit of time learning and oh, still learning. The, the thing about security is it's like drinking out of a fire hose. It just once it turns on and if you get hooked, I mean, it, it's there's nothing like it as far as security. But that's how I got my start. And then years and years later, I actually started doing pen tests and worked as a professional penetration tester for quite a while. And so that's kind of how I got my start. Cool. That's really neat. Can you give the audience, I know we have some people that listen to the show that are uh, well, well versed in the cybersecurity community and have, have had an interest in hacking in a long time. And other people that are like, uh, like you said, isn't ethical hacking uh, kind of an oxymoron? So can yep. you clarify some of the terminology for people? So we often oh, hear yeah. red hat, gray hat, and white hat hacking. Yep. Well, really, we've got we've got the white hat, black hat, and gray hat are the are the three. And then you've got red teams and blue teams. So those are kind of the, the colors that we go through. A white hat, I always attribute this back to the spaghetti westerns. The guy with the white hat, he's the good guy, you know, especially black and white television. Hey, that I can see that hat. That guy's the good guy. Don't mess with him. 
or he's going to win in the end. The same idea here where the white hat is the guy that is always having permission before they do anything. So if I, you know, say for your site, you wanted me to do a test, I would have plenty of permission. You would know way in advance. I wouldn't be doing anything malicious or outside of scope. That's the white hat. They're really doing things the right way with permission, quote unquote, the good guys. Oversimplification because mm-hmm. immediately have the gray hats. The gray hats are the people that are, you know, these are these are the people I would think of as the security researchers that have the best intention in mind, but maybe don't have permission. So, you know, somebody's gone out to my site and noticed that I, I have an old version of something. And so they send me an email and say, hey, you're vulnerable. I see that as more of a gray hat. It's like, I never asked you to do that. Hey, thanks for letting me know about the vulnerability. Yes, I'll fix it. But I see those as being the gray hats. They're kind of in the middle. And then the black hats, uh, they're the ones that just, you know, they roll up their sleeves and they go for it. They don't need permission. And they're usually getting some sort of monetary return. So I have a lot of people that say, well, you know, hey, Brian, nobody would ever want to attack me. I don't have anything of interest. And I ask them, you know, point blank, hey, do you do you have any kids? And oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have, do you have pictures? Yeah. So if I encrypted all of your pictures, you wouldn't pay me to get those back. And they're like, yeah, I probably would. That's what the black hat hackers doing. They're out there making money. A lot of them are for working with criminal organizations. A lot of them are, you know, even beyond that into nation states and things like that. But I see I, that's the way I delineate those. The white hat over stereotyped the good guys gray hat kind of in the middle of the road the black hat those are the guys that are out there doing bad things oversimplified then you have the red teams and the blue teams blue teams are the ones that are defending so these are you know typically when i would do a pen test these would be my network guys or the the in-house security team that was trying to catch me before i could do any mischief Usually when they were trying to catch me, it was already too late. They had some some silly little hole open that I had already you know drove the Mack truck through. But the blue team are the defenders. Well, again, oversimplified, they're the defenders. The red teams, usually, depending on the size of the organization, a red team would be a team that worked for the organization that had a lot of knowledge, but they were the attackers. They're the offensive security people. They have different scopes for red team exercises versus regular pen tests. So that gets into kind of some other areas, which I don't want to bore the the listeners with all of that details, (laughs) but those are kind of the colors that we use for it. And some of the, some of the terminology that we use too. So would you often see kind of in the pen testing world that the blue team is kind of the company, the the, the customer and the red team is the consultant that's coming in to do the, the test? A lot of times. And the I didn't do a lot of red team engagements because those are, depending on who's going to define it. And yeah, I know you had Ed Scotus on here recently. So if he's listening, Ed, be kind. So the, the red teams are usually the ones that are coming in trying to be low and slow. They're trying to be secret. They're not trying to be caught. So they're trying to give as much as accurate of a pen test as possible, emulating what the real threat, fac- threat, att- threat vectors are what a real attacker would do. Pen test, I'm still trying to do that same thing, but for my pen test, I'm not too worried about being caught because that's kind of part of it too. You know, testing to see when I kick off the scanner that's scanning your entire internet range, did you notice? You know, and a lot of times with the pen test, I'll even call them and say, hey, I'm about to scan, check your logs. Where red team, it's usually I'm giving a report at the end and they're like, wait, you were here? What? <laughs> So I, I thought the contract wasn't starting until next week. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, yeah, it quote was, but it didn't. So, yeah. So I, I do have a little bit of experience. Uh, at one point I was working for a company where we, we brought in a pen test company mm-hmm. and, you know, I thought, you know, you know I, I had taken over the department about a year prior and I was like, well, I, I feel reasonably good about the stuff that the current team has done, but I was kind of like, I, I just don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't, this is, you know, years and years ago, but I'd never really heard of pen testing. And mm-hmm. it was a rec- recommendation from a law firm. It's like, okay, so we'll do this. And um, 
what ended up happening is they found a lot of legacy things that I didn't even know existed that mm-hmm. were really poorly designed, total, you know, I wouldn't say totally wide open, but yeah, very exploitable, very open. Yeah. That it was like, I, I didn't even know that existed. So, like, is that something that, that you've run across a lot? Is because I think, a like, lot. you yes. know, I, I had. Uh, the episode hasn't aired yet as we're recording this, but will have aired by the time this one goes live. You know, I think a lot of times now companies are are designing for privacy and security from the beginning. But if you're coming into a company that's been around for 10, 15, 20 years, it's kind of hard to to know, well, what did the guy 20 years ago, how, how good was the code that he wrote? What were the things that he looked at 20 years ago? Yep. Do, you, do you see that kind of thing as being a all, significant vector? All the time. And since we're kind of doing the buzzword bingo, yeah, that's kind of called tech debt. So in an, in an industry, when they're developing, when they've been around for a while, they're going to get some sort of technical debt, be it a legacy system, be it an application that nobody knows what that does, so don't touch that. I saw that all the time. And another term is low-hanging fruit. So these are the things that the, the highest risk that you're going to find that you may or may not even know is out there too. Maybe it's an older system, older operating system, old servers, old application, or just you know you're using Telnet and FTP, which are you know open, open, um, open text protocols. So everything that goes across the wire, you get to see. Versus you know some of the more secure protocols that are in use now. I saw that all the time. So and I, and one of the funner things was usually I. I don't know, maybe maybe I'm a little cantankerous, but I'd always hook up with the system administrator beforehand and just kind of talk to him and, and get to know him a little bit because I would usually use their accounts to get into stuff. And so, you know, they'd always be telling me how secure it was and how great this was and how great that was. And then, you know, I'd tell them their password and walk away. <laughs> so, so you know, that, there, was, there was always surprises too. And a lot of the teams, I, I know my first pen test, I was told that, oh, we've got a whole team. You know, we've been working on this for years. We've had pen test after pen test. We're good. We're secure. You're not going to get in. And, you know, of course, I'm thinking this is one of my first pen tests. Great. Well, I fire up my email. And, and at the time, most emails would actually phone home if you put a little little special signature mm-hmm. in there. What it was was I was sim- simply saying, hey, I've got a picture that I need you to go back and get. But hold on. You need to authenticate first. And... Outlook very happily be like, oh, okay, well, here's my credentials. And then I start cracking on the credentials and I'm in a short time later. So I was getting this email ready and I'm thinking, okay, this probably won't work because they're you know, really secure. Hit enter, away it goes. And I call up my my point of contact and I tell him, okay, I'm about ready to start. And I look over my screen and poof, up pops his credentials. And I'm like, or well, we'll, we'll eventually be his credentials when I crack them. Put it into a cracker, let it run. It opens up. Like 10 minutes later, I call him back and I'm like, yeah, I'm in. And he's like, in, in what? It's like, yeah, I made myself a domain admin in your system. You know, if you want to go check it out. And he's like, no, no. And he puts down the phone and I hear it gets really, really quiet. <laughs> and I hear a whole bunch of typing. And then I hear this <laughs> bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> he picks up the phone. And he's like, how'd you do it? And I was like, well, I, I and one thing for, for pen, testers, pen testers that are out there that are just starting. Here's a rule of thumb. Never tell how you got in until you're done. I, I, I was being a nice guy. So I was like, hey, well, you know, I used your username and password and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yep. He changed his password. He locked me out of my account and made me take like another 20 minutes to find another way in. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's good. You found the second way in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep. I, so, so kind of reversing things a little bit, mm-hmm. or maybe not, that's right, maybe that's not the right phrase. We, you talked a little bit about, we had talked about gray hack, uh, gray, gray hat uh, hacking. And it's mm-hmm. kind of the, uh, I'll sometimes put it in quotes, security. They, they like to call themselves security researchers. And I think yeah. some legitimately are, but I think most are people that are using very well-established public tools, entering a little bit of information, and then, copying and pasting the report out of that tool and saying, look at all this incredible work that I did and I discovered da, 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 da. It's like, no, you just went to some website and entered something. Exactly. What's your philosophy on 
for for businesses in engaging with people that are hey I'm a security researcher and I discovered this be very careful and I would suggest getting legal involved as soon as possible just from the point of view of making sure legal is aware what's going on uh, there's there's so many variables with that it, what if what if the person decides that oh you didn't pay enough and then decides to disclose do you have NDAs in place? So the number one thing is get legal involved. And and not because they did anything wrong or you're going to go after them. It's just protecting protecting yourself, you know, and making sure that if they do something, you do have some sort of recourse that you can do. So I always say get legal involved and just be very careful. I approach them. I approach with uh, an amount of respect. It's like, hey, great, you found something. Can you show me what it is? I want demos. I want to see screenshots. And it's also, did the person go so far as, hey, I exfiltrated your entire customer database and I have it on my on my drive here. It's like, okay, you're not a security researcher. You're, you're, you're trying to do something else. Yeah. You're wanting to get paid and you're going to hold me for ransom. This is, versus, yeah, this is now ransom or extortion versus, hey, exactly. I just, I found a problem. I think you need to do something about it because your customers are at risk. Exactly, exactly. And there's a lot of great researchers out there. I mean, fantastic ones like Sammy Kankar. I, you know, I, I think the world of him, he, he does things correctly. He will disclose, he, he gives time for people to repair things. So, I mean, there's a lot of great security researchers that are out there that are doing the right things that do want to help. And that's what motivates me is I, that's why I talk about security and you know, why I'm you know, thrilled to be on your podcast. I want to share these things with people. A lot of people think it's, it's, next to impossible to be hacked and other people think it's way too easy to be hacked and well it's somewhere in the middle and if you're using crappy passwords and thinking that you know the season and the year is going to get you by because it changes every th every three months or every four months i know that too by the way so i'm going to try that you know when i was pen testing that's the first thing we'd do is we'd go out do some, grab, grab grab some information social media is fantastic i'll, I'll know where 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 people work because they're going to post it on LinkedIn, they're going to, you know, Facebook and all the different social media platforms. Go as a pen tester, I go search those. I gather that information. So when I'm talking to Barbara, I know Barbara works at blankety blank, and that she does HR there, and that because she's in HR, I can throw her name around. And now, you know, now I can do my social engineering stuff. Which, you know, social engineering, I simplify my definition and. And I know the, the guys over at the socialengineering.org won't like it, but I think social engineering is just getting people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. Three common ways, you know, via email, which, of course, we call phishing. I have no idea why we have to spell it with a PH, but we do. <laughs> and then we've got the phone based, which is phishing because, well, we had phishing, I guess. So we have to have voice and then physical. And I haven't found any, you know, buzzword term for physical yet besides it's physical. <laughs> So oh, those are the three oh, ways. Don't forget smishing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could send you a text base, a text message, and now I'm, I'm smishing you. Yep, yep, exactly. So, so we 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 talked about uh, you talked a little bit about disclosure, um, mm -hmm. and that kind of ties in with bounty programs. So, what is responsible disclosure and bounty programs? How do those kind of things tie in together? Responsible disclosure, from my point of view is if I find something, I contact the company first. So I don't go to the New York Times and say, hey, look what I found. I go to the company first, and I give them a, an ample amount of time. Now, I, I, Google has a certain amount of time that they give companies. Other security researchers have kind of set amounts of time. Other people just say, well, hey, this looks simple. You should be able to fix it in a week. If you don't fix it, I'm going to disclose. A responsible disclosure, from my point of view, is negotiating all that with the person or the company that you're disclosing the, inf the vulnerability to. It is being responsible. Instead of just going out and tweeting about, hey, check this out, and then all the bad guys get to run and you know empty the database or empty the cash register for the company, you know, be responsible. Bug bounties tie into that because now as bug bounty programs, if, if a company A has a bug bounty program, I, as a security researcher, I know how to contact them. I know that I might, I know if I will or won't get paid because they usually disclose that. And if I'm working with one of these companies like HackerOne or um, 
I just blanked out on the other company that's Casey Ellis isn't going to like me. I blanked out on the name of his company. But um, there are other bug bounty companies out there where if I, me as company A, I would go to them and say, hey, I want to do a bug bounty. You take care of it. So there are even sources, there are even companies that just outsource the entire thing for you. And then they have their fleet of hackers come in and do the attacking and do the testing. So there's kind of different ways of doing it, depending on the company, the size, how much you want to manage it. Is, is, that, is that the sort of thing where, where a company, at what point should a company kind of start thinking about, do we want to have a, a bounty program? That's a great question. And one that's kind of loaded with fraught uh, depends, you know, depends on your listeners. I may be getting calls, but wh- what I, what I always suggest is start with the basics first. Number one, are you patching? Have you had any sort of assessments done? If you're not patching, don't get a pen test, start patching first, because it, I'm just going to come in as a pen tester and tell you, you need to patch. That's not money well spent. So patch first, Remove services that you don't need. Do some sort of a basic, uh, it's called a port scan. Go out there and just do a port scan to see what services are listening, at least on the internet. Do a little bit of due diligence. Then, as you have your kind of those ducks in a row, I would suggest doing a pen test. At that point, how quickly can you work off those things that are in the, in the report? How well do you work off the findings? If you're getting into a process and you can work off those findings, you're ready for bug bounty because you have processes in place. The remediations, you know, if it's if it's an application and you've had a pen test done and you got things remediated, great. The developers are they're remediating the code, they're remediating the findings. That's a great time to move forward. A lot of times people find just other problems with the process. Remediating a finding is a lot harder than finding it. And I've learned that the hard way. So yeah, I, I've run across the same things. It was like something was like, oh, that's very clearly a problem. Ooh, fixing it is this <laughs> is this cask like, oh, well, that's easy to fix. And you get in the code and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. but that ties in with this other uh well, now I gotta do this and oh wait, now there's this other thing and well now we gotta go out to an outside company to deal with that. Uh-huh. Oh my goodness, this is getting really complicated really fast. Exactly. Well, and like for application security. My mindset, you know, as a security guy, it's it's easy. You know, you sanitize input and code output. Don't roll your own crypto. And you do authentication and authorization. Easy peasy. Well, when I talk to the developers, they're like, well, I can't sanitize my input because I'm using some other library that won't let me do that. I can't encode my outputs because the next the next step along the pro- process, my up, upstream dependency needs that. Real world versus, you know, the kind of the, the world the security guy wishes it was, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's I think that ties back in even what I was talking about earlier is that, the, you know, like you're talking about the legacy systems, the tech debt. If you're starting from scratch, maybe you can deal with a lot of these things on the front end and plan for them and I think agree. about, okay, anytime that we're moving system from one or moving data from one system to another, it has to be sent encrypted. Nothing gets sent in the clear. Okay, mm-hmm. if we're – who really needs access to this data? Okay, let's tie it down and make it so that only the systems that need access can get access to it and exactly. certain fields and all that kind of fun stuff. Yep. Well, for years, I've been on a crusade for HTTPS everywhere. You just use HTTPS everywhere. No reason not to until people sit me down and show me the reasons why they can't. <laughs> so everything's simple until you go to implement it, I think. so. Well, And then it was, okay, well, we'll do HTTPS everywhere. How long of a certificate can I get? Exactly. And, and now we're talking about what uh, certificates are limiting out of what, a year now? A year, yep, and exactly. And even talk of tightening that up even more. It's like, oh, uh, introducing a lot of human error by making like, – it's it's that balance between, well, if you're having to renew certificates frequently, you either need an automated process or you need a human involved, which means more human error. Yep. But if you leave your certificate around for a really long time – you can almost get a human there the other way. They forget about it. Exactly. Exactly. And then you have key management as well. And, oh, yeah, it gets nasty really quick. Just yeah. if you want to 
get security people to freak out. Just ask them to explain crypto to you. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I, I think I have a good basic for cryptography, but still, I still am Googling the simplest stuff, you know? So. Yeah. Every, every time I think I have a, a, a fair idea of what cryptography is, I, I read something and go, I, I don't understand that. That doesn't mm-hmm. make sense to me. I, exactly. And then I talk to someone who knows what they're talking about, and it all just goes over my head very quickly. <laughs> yep. So you're doing the summation here, and as it's approaching the limit, you're, yeah, sure. Yep. Huh? What? Okay, yep. I'll, I'll just trust someone else to do it. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> so so if someone is interested in becoming a pen tester, mm-hmm. a white hat, ethical hacking, how do people get into that industry? I mean, I think when, when you were getting involved in it, yeah, there probably wasn't, uh, you know, hacker hacking one hundred and one at the local community college. Right. It was something you just picked up on the job and over the water cooler and on, you know, chat groups. And- well, I learned social engineering because I needed to go to these hacking classes, and my bosses wouldn't send me. So I had to learn social engineering to convince them that it was really their best interest to send me these hacking classes. So that that's how I started. And way back when, it was Foundstone Ultimate Hacking. That's the first class I ever took way, way, way back. And it's just getting into the community. Right now, there are so many uh, Capture the Flag events. Take, take advantage of that. Join into those Capture the Flag events. There's so many mentors that are there that they want to help. Uh, we have a very good community that once you get in, the doors start opening, but it is kind of hard to initially get in because mm-hmm. there is so many people that are like, Oh, I'd love to do that, but don't put the effort in. And, and uh, I think a lot of people in the industry are kind of keyed in on that. If you're going to put in the effort, we'll help you. If you're just going to want to hand up, it's harder. People aren't going to help you as much, mm-hmm. but if you have some initiative, you're doing some of the capture of the flag events, uh, reach out, uh, ISSA events, uh, all kinds of different things. Just start to get some involvement with the community. OWASP is a great organization. Uh, the Open Web Application Security Project. They are fantastic, and they're they're all over the United States. Just start taking part. Just jump out and you know tell people, hey, I'm a noob. I want to learn. You know, and, and they'll respect that far more than if you come in trying to say you know everything. So, so when you refer to a capture the flag event, can you clarify mm-hmm. what that is for the listener? Well, there's all kinds of different ones. The ones that are probably the easiest is they're online and it, everything from, you know, hack this site.com to actual sponsored events where it's like, okay, we're going to bring up a banking website. We need everybody to register. And then for the next three days, we're going to hack on this website and it scores points. So, you know, as I find uh, cross-site scripting, hey, I got 50 points. You know, if I if I find another injection attack, say, oh, hey, here's a SQL injection, and I can pull back all the credit cards out of the database. Hey, I just got 1,000 points. That's really what it is. It's kind of a scored event. And a lot of times, well, back before we had this little thing called COVID, we'd actually meet with people and do it in a group, and then that would be even better. There's a lot of different um, hacking groups that are available. I know here in Denver, we have uh, DC 303. There's the 303 group here as well. There, if you look, they're out there. And DEF CON is a great, great thing to do as well if you don't mind 30,000 crazy people walking around about how to launder their crypto. You know, you, <laughs> I, I was in line at a DEF CON, and, the guy comes, and a guy comes up to me, and he's like, hey, you got a washing machine. And I'm like, I what what i'm at a hotel what do you mean do i have a washing machine he's like i got some crypto you got a washing machine and i'm like i'm not gonna launder your cryptocurrency please go away and that's defcon you have all kinds of stuff i have i admit i am deathly afraid of going to something like defcon or really? black hat i it's one of those things is like okay so i need to go to a conference and i need to leave every piece of technology at home <laughs> Well, as I'm watching my cell phone go no, from 4G no, to 3G. No credit yeah. cards, no yeah. phone, no Apple Watch, no no nothing. I, I take my DEF CON time as kind of a public service. I walk around saying, you might not want to use that ATM. <laughs> so, you know, and the one year they, 
the one year, I don't know which group did, but they rolled in their own ATM into the casino. Oh. And nobody noticed for a couple of days. And it's like, oh, my word. <laughs> and then, of course, it you know, got some publicity that there's a strange ATM in the casino. <laughs> I, I long ago had heard that one, uh, a very similar thing, that someone had basically rolled up a, a an ATM machine on some street corner somewhere. And when people wanted to hunt, you know, they wanted 20s, 40, you know, they wanted $400. It would spit out the money that they asked for. Mm. And it was the, apparently it was there for several weeks, spitting mm. out whatever money you wanted. It would spit out as it's collecting your pin code and reading uh -huh. the magnetic stripe. And then they either sold it or they wiped out everybody's accounts a few days, you know, a few days later exactly. because it wasn't suspicious because it was working. Exactly. Exactly. You, you get suspicious when you go up to an ATM machine and then like, well, I know I entered my right pin code. Why is it saying connection error? And every mm -hmm. single person is having that same problem. Hmm. Yeah. Why does it have a blue screen of death from a Windows box? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think one, maybe one good reference is we were talking about Ed Scotus and mm -hmm. uh, the, I have to get the entity right. Uh, Sands Institute. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, they run a holiday hack challenge every year. Mm -hmm. And for those who want to hear a little bit about it, you should go back to listen to the Ed Scotus episode. We Definitely. talked about a few cases where the actual hack challenge actually got hacked mm -hmm. and they got into the inner workings of the, uh, inner workings of the, uh, the game, so to speak. Yep. And so that is probably a good place for, uh, all levels of people who want to learn a bit, little bit about hacking, whether it's younger kids, it's my understanding is it's fairly scaled mm -hmm. uh, from very from from fair from fairly simple to extremely difficult things to do. Exactly, yeah. And some of those some of those challenges I have never been able to solve. Others of them I've been able to jump right in and oh, that's obvious. So yeah, <laughs> those are always fun. And you know I. The SANS training is great, too. There's a lot of different places to get fantastic training. So I, you know, I'll put in a plug. Ed, if you take a class with Ed, you're getting real training. It's practical. It's grounded. You know. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give a little testimonial for, for Ed. I took one of his classes and got started that way. So, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I, I know you, in your in your public speaking, you talk about risk assessment and impact. And mm -hmm. so how does a company – uh, prioritize, you know, we, we've had a pen test done, we've had an ethical hacker come in and they've found uh, a laundry list of things. There's a certain amount of like, okay, some of these things are really simple and easy. We can get them off of mm -hmm. our checklist really quick and it's 15 minutes or an hour, or a couple hours of work. But then there's things that are uh, a lot more complex to fix, you know, that may take days, weeks, or months to fix. What kind of assessment does a company need to make in terms of which one of these things should we be applying our resources towards? For risk, I come back to two main points, the likelihood and the impact. As there, as a company is reading through the report, I like to keep these two questions in mind. What is the likelihood and what's the impact? If the likelihood is really high, but there's no impact, you know, say defacing a web page that we no longer use, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. Versus the corporate site, I can deface it. That's a different issue because the impact is huge. Now I'm, now I'm having media events left and right. I'm having to answer questions to reporters that I really don't want to answer. So I always come back to the likelihood and the impact. Good pen test reports are going to tell you that. They're going to say, hey, this is low skill level to be able to exploit and high, prob or high impact if I do get in because, hey, I didn't do it but we could have easily taken your customer database or I could have easily gotten credit card numbers. I saw where they were, but I left them, that type of thing. So that's the number one thing I come back to. And make sure that you engage the pen test team. Any questions at all, engage them, find out. And don't wait, because a lot of times I had customers that would wait. I would want to do a closeout call. They would wait, they would wait. And then a month later, they'd call me. I honestly don't remember what that was at that point. So keep in mind your pen testers, they're, they're burning and churning too. They're going right to the next one, the next one, the next one. So leverage them while you have their time and their attention and make sure that you get your questions answered. And 
did they supply proof of concepts? Did they show you ways that your own internal team could prove that this was remediated later? That's critical because I don't want to be going and chasing down the pen test team saying, how'd you do this again? How could I prove this? You say it's wrong, but you don't show me how to do it. So make sure you have some proof of concepts in there too. I, I like that. I don't know that I've heard people mention that before is having the pen test people sh- like, this mm-hmm. is how we did it. And this is how you can, how you know you've actually fixed it because here's how we did it. Exactly. I've, I've yeah, usually just seen the, the results of here's what's wrong. Oh, it's up to you to figure out how to fix it. Well, that's not our job. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it, I've had some of those pen test reports too, where it's just like, oh yeah, all this is wrong. It's like, great. That's not really helpful. And then I've had the other pen test reports where this is wrong. Here's why. Here's the risk. And you need to fix this one first. Although, by the way, we've prioritized everything. The, the ones in the front, do them first. Those are great pen test reports. So, But you can have a great pen tester who writes a horrible report, too. Yeah. So your mileage may vary. Well, and so I think it makes sense is when you're looking for a pen test company that you talk about, well, what kind of reports are you going to produce? Can you provide mm-hmm. me some samples? Exactly. Of, yes. Of, of Maybe they're not real reports, but samples of what a report would look like, what types of recommendations you make. Do you, exactly. Do you, do you help us with? I don't. I don't. I don't know if pen testers come in and help actually resolve issues. There are some companies that are actually specializing in that. I approach it with some some hesitation because if I'm going to come in and I find the risk and then tell you how to fix it, I I don't want to be in that in that conflict of interest or even that perceived conflict of conflict of interest there. I want to find it or either fix it one or the other, but there are some companies that are doing both and they seem to be doing pretty well to, to manage that conflict of, well, that apparent conflict of interest. And, and I suppose it depends on what your, who your customer is and what the, what type of system mm-hmm. that you're pen testing. There might not be a, a very a significant conflict of interest on something like that. Exactly. It could yep. be like, no, they're the experts. They can fix it, and it's not really a conflict of interest. I, exactly. I would be worried from the legal aspect of you found it, you said you fixed it, but you didn't, and we got compromised anyway. Yes. Now <laughs> it's your fault, not our fault. <laughs> yep. Yeah, plausible deniability and all that as well. And, and another thing is just retesting. I When I was – because as I was a pen tester, I spent some time later – doing pre-sales for the for pen testing and selling them. A lot of companies and a lot of customers never asked about retesting. Hmm. And That's a good point. There, you can definitely negotiate that into the contract that, hey, for a limited amount of time, because you don't, again, you don't want to say a year later, come back and have somebody retest. But for a limited period of time, when we do our remediations, they will retest. And that also puts a different motivation on the internal staff too, that, hey, the time is ticking, we need to get it done. So I'm not if I'm internal, I'm not as I'm not as much of the bad guy. Yeah, I'm still with the security team telling you no, but at the same time, there's some other force that's business related that's driving it. And you know, once you get the business in there with the money and the dollar signs, people listen a little bit more. So Yeah, I I, I, I could imagine that there's a lot of companies that have had a pen test done, they get the report and it gets put in a file cabinet and nobody does anything. I come back a year later and I put on a different date and I give you the same report back pretty much. And that's that's one of the things that kind of burnt me out on pen testing too was that it was a lot of that where I would come back into the same organization, maybe some different people, maybe a little bit more enthusiasm, but it's the exact same results for the test. That same system that I said was critical to patch, you still haven't patched. And that, that got old. I, I really wanted to make a difference. I wanted to have an impact there and that was one of the things that I kind of started to get burned out about. And I think that's kind of common in the field too. I mean, we do want to see things improve. Do you think that's because, you know, uh, the the law firm said, hey, have a pen test. And so we're doing our due diligence to check it off on a list there, but we're not really willing to spend the money to have our teams fix stuff? That kind of ties me into something, uh, uh, compliance versus risk so that's kind of the compliance aspect where, you know, XYZ compliance thing says we have to have a pen test. Check. Okay, we're done. We're compliant. That's one way to see the world. Then there's the risk-based way. 
and that's risk management. That there are risks here. What are we doing for it? You know, I talked about an ATM earlier. I love the the acronym for risk. ATM. You either accept it, transfer it, or mitigate it. So it's money when you're dealing with risk. That's my little catchphrase thing. I like that. So that's good. I, I like to come back to that time and time again. What are you really doing for risk? There are, were a ton of companies that they were honest. They're like, yeah, we just need this for compliance. Okay. We would, you know, I'd give you, give you a lower quote because I know what you're wanting to do. We're just going to do the minimums for you. Yes, we're still going to give you a good pen test. But here it's a lot less because we know what you're doing. So versus the people who are really risk mindset and, and really doing risk management, oh no, I'm gonna, that's where I'm going to do the threat profile ahead of time. I want to figure out what, who is really going to be attacking you. What would they attack? You know, is it all going to be social based, where you know I'm just sending emails, or is it technical, where you have a whole bunch of technical debt that I can leverage? Yeah, you know, that that was kind of the difference. That's how the scopes were built. I like. I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense. Is you have to know why the company wants the pen test, why they want. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate exactly. when when compliance is just a checkbox as opposed to, no, no, there's there's a problem you need to solve here. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, unfortunately, there's probably an awful lot of that in the world. Unfortunately, I see that. I saw that a lot. Yep. So, and doing the compliance thing, I I'm, I'm guilty of doing that when I was really into the compliance side too. Because it's just so fast. It's like, no, I, I've got to do the PCI thing. I've got to get that done. Okay, now, okay, now, what's the next one? Okay, I've got PCI. Oh, what's the CCPA thing from California? What's this? Yeah, it, and they seem to never end too. Because once you do one, there's three more. And so. I, you know, I think that's that. That just is compliance. There's always going to be, hey, there's version two. There's this new thing. <laughs> there's the state one. There's the federal one. There's yeah. A, a conglomerate of states want, and, and, and what do you do when they conflict? I don't know. Yep. <laughs> so we, we were kind of joking before we started recording. Um, you know, what what can what are the things that every cybersecurity person tells individuals to do? You know, uh, password manager, uh, uh -huh. two factor authentication, and, and we we had a little bit of a discussion around. Everyone says that, but everybody hates two-factor authentication. I do. I I'm, I get so annoyed and agitated that I have to pull out my phone to go into Authy or whatever you know my authenticator is and get that little code. But at the same time, you know, I'm on stage saying you have to have multi-factor. Make sure you're not just doing a password. Make sure it's something you have, something you are, something you know, and it's a combination of that and. And then I turn around and I'm doing it and I'm like, this, yeah, it's something I have, something I am, something I know. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Muttering under our breaths. Yep, yep. It's like, yeah, let me type in this damn number again. Yep, exactly. So, it, you know, it's like, you know, I tell people, you know, inevitably what will happen is we'll say, you know, turn on two-factor authentication, SMS, and someone will inevitably will send me an email saying SMS is – it's 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 no it's not secure. You know, people can sim swap. SMS is is, is totally useless for security. I, yeah, I think if you're a well known individual, if you're a particularly targeted individual, you're a high wealth individual. Maybe SMS is maybe not necessarily the best route to go for you for two factor authentication. But then on the flip side, there was a, as I was saying before. Uh, earlier is I have uh, family overseas and mm -hmm. they pull out their keychains and where they live, SMS two factor authentication is not the way to go. It's physical hardware token and mm -hmm. they pull out their keychain and there's 16 hardware tokens on their keychain and they're getting to the website and they're supposed to enter it. And by the time they find the right token, it's reset and then they got to reset it again and find oh, here's the token. And oh, I, mi I, I misentered the number. Let me try again. It reset. Ah, you know, yep. and everyone's carrying around this, you know, pocket full of tokens. Mm -hmm. I I kind of wonder where we're going from this because, you know, the uh, Authy and Google Authenticator, there's – I don't want to say that there's risk associated. The bigger risk associated with that is I migrated to a new phone and I forgot to move over <laughs> – mm -hmm. I, for, I forgot to properly port over Google Authenticator and now I'm locked out of everything. Because I so, don't have that phone anymore. Yep. Oh, 
<laughs> what do you, where, from your perspective, where do you see this going? And, and is SMS good enough for most of us? You're going to get letters, but yes, I think SMS is good enough for most of us. Now, if I tick off a nation state, no. You know, if I if I tell hackers point blank, you can't get me, no, no. it's not going to be enough because I'm just making myself a target. But it, it's better than nothing is the way that I approach it. Yeah. That if I'm just using my password, and let's talk about passwords for a second too. I mean, let's make sure that they are something complex. And that's why the password manager immediately comes in. I have 300 different passwords that are all unique that are stored in this password manager. I know one of them to get into the thing. And yes, it's multi-factor to get in, which is part of my annoyance, but you know, <laughs> cause to get to the password, I have to type in, but yeah, but that's, that's where I would start is where, what are you doing for passwords? Making sure they're complex. Yes. I, I'm one of these security guys that says they should be 15 characters or longer. There's a technical reason for it. it won't bore your listeners with it. Um, but it's, you know, LM hashes, but it's <laughs> couldn't resist. It's one piece with your password. So I, I make it as complex as possible. Then I add another piece and I'm just making it harder for somebody to target me. And if somebody else, it's this idea that my neighbor across the street has their doors open, their windows open with a big old welcome mat with arrows that say, come on in. And I have bars on my windows. Well, odds are they're going to go for the house next door. That's really kind of what I encourage people to do is just make them want to go to the house next door because it's easier to get in. And if you have SMS, you're making it just a little bit harder. Yes, it's not impossible. Yes, it's crackable. It's breakable. Yes, I can still get in if I'm determined. It's better than just a password. Yeah, it's it's, it's it, with the home analogy. It's it's better to have a a not a very good deadbolt on your front door versus no deadbolt on your front door. Exactly. Exactly. But it's not name brand. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but it's a deadbolt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and I think that's, you know, I, I think security purists will, you know, uh, well, but it's, it's not secure. Well, it's, it's still, yep. what's the expression? Good enough security that for most people in most circumstances, it's yep. good enough to protect them from most things. My as term a, that I've, go ahead, Chris. As, term as, as opposed using. to perfect security, which is unattainable. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The term I've been using is adequate security. Mm, yeah. And so as I'm talking with people, let, let's look at adequate security. And I, I also really want to ground in real world practical things. You know, that, that really complex hack where I can tie these four different things together and, you know, wait 20 minutes and then the toaster pops up and boom, I've hacked you. Okay, I've guessed your password and I've changed all of that so you can't do it anyway. I mean, let's, let's go for the big bang for the buck, you know. Stay practical. Passwords are, are still used, so they're critical. Don't reuse them because the second they're lost, well, now everybody's doing this credential spraying stuff where... I go out, you know, Troy Hunt has his, uh -huh. his site for, for all the passwords, right? So it's the same idea. Other people are gathering those passwords too. Now, I, I like what Troy's doing. I, you know, he provides a great service with that. There are other people that are gathering those and cracking them just so that they could reuse them yep. and just say, hey, Chris, did you use your the same password on LinkedIn? Did you use it on Facebook? Did you use it on your bank account? Did you use it? You did use it on your bank oh, account. Oh, how about that? And there, there they go, right? Yep. So yeah, passwords are, are still important. And yeah. yes, multi-factor, that, that evil thing that it is. Yeah, have some other factor there. Because, again, you're just making it harder for somebody else to get in. Yeah, you're making it harder for you to get in, too. But bigger picture, a little more safety, a yeah. little lower risk. And that's what I think everyone has to – you kind of have to bite the bolt of, like, look, it's my bank account. You, you – you need to have some extra safety there. Like someone getting into your retirement account, it's going to change your yeah. retirement. Someone getting into your bank account, it's going to change your bank account. Uh, someone getting into your O'Reilly Auto Parts account, that probably not so significant. Yeah, exactly. But, but you know, for those key things, if, if you're not going to apply it everywhere, apply it where you really need to. Agreed. Exactly. I don't think I would put on two-factor authentication on my O'Reilly Auto Parts account. <laughs> well, I don't have multi-factor everywhere for that very reason. Yeah. <laughs> it, yep. beca it, it becomes a bit overwhelming at times. 
Exactly. Exactly. And, un- and unnecessary, too, because yeah. that's the thing with security. All the controls that are in place, they, de- they need to be tested, too, because just because I have a control in place doesn't mean it's working and it doesn't mean that it's doing what I think it's doing. So every control, there's a little bit of overhead, not only with a system, but somebody manually has to go through and check it or a system has to check it because that, that leads to a word called called assurance. Mm-hmm. And assurance is just that it's. What I have in place, I know is working as I expect it to be working. And that's a lot of what a pen test does, too, is it gives you assurance or takes your assurance away in a lot of cases, too. So what I'm hearing you say is every now and then when you get that two-factor authentication text message, type in the wrong number and see what happens. Yes, definitely. (laughs) And I did that for my website, and I got right in. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. This is not supposed to do this. like, oh, it it didn't work. (laughs) <laughs> yep. But I fixed that glitch. So if anybody's out there thinking I have a glitch out there, it's not that one. Yeah, and in fact, I don't use SMS on my website anymore. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Yep. laughs> and I don't have a website anymore. <laughs> oh, I'm getting to that point, too. Yeah. It's like daily. Something new has to be patched on the website. So, <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. That's and and I think that's com- that's for businesses. That's you know, we talked mm-hmm. about patching. It It becomes. It becomes a chore that, oh, well, I've got to patch yes. this. I've got to patch that. Um, you know, the the one that I, that surprisingly with running what is my IP address.com, I end up finding a lot of people, uh, talking with a lot of people who had, oh, and I can't think of the brand of the router now. Um, they didn't patch their routers. Uh, Microtix? Is that what it was? Microtix? Oh, uh, that. Almost all of them have had these types of issues. Yeah, but there was, you know, there was some, you know, a million routers got compromised. Yeah. I think it was Microtix and or firewalls. And like, so people outside would be able to effectively surf the web as if they were using your router as a VPN. And Mm -hmm. well, like who thinks to patch the router that's been sitting in their closet? They didn't buy it. Their ISP gave it to them. Isn't the ISP responsible for that? Uh, well, I don't even know if they can patch it for you, but like, exactly. Th- I think that's one of the challenges is that there's just so, there can be so many things for exactly. people to try to keep track of that. It just becomes overwhelming. And actually let's talk about that just for a second for your, for your listeners too. Microsoft is not going to call you yes. to help you patch your box. Apple's not going to call you either. Nor, nor Apple, um, nor Oracle. <laughs> But and I recently had one of my one of my longtime users that I that I just work with, one of my clients. She called and she said, yeah, my ISP just called and wants me to patch my router. What should I do? I was like, well, hang up. And she's like, OK, I went over. I checked the router. Doesn't need anything. They were just simply wanting to get in free. Yep. And that happens all the time. So and the IRS won't call you about your taxes. No. Nope. And and the. And the, and the IRS is definitely not sending out the local magistrate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> and for those who are listening who are not U.S. citizens, one of the things that I think U.S. residents laugh about is when we get the scam calls and there's the wrong terminology for government officials and judges and and things like that. Like, hmm, okay, I know that. Yeah, I, the buddy of mine, I kept <clears throat> I kept telling him – about this banister that was calling me. And he's like, banister? I was like, well, yeah, yeah, lawyer. He's like, you mean barrister? I was like, oh, man. No wonder people have been laughing at me for years about that. So, yeah, it's not a barrister. It's not a banister. Okay, yeah. So. Oh, too hilarious. So before we wrap up, is there any parting words? I think we've, we've talked about patching. We've talked about mm-hmm. passwords, SMS, and our – or hatred of SMS tokens. <laughs> yeah, well, the the one thing I always like to, to talk about, the little email attack that I talked about in the beginning, a lot of a lot of clients will disallow phoning home to complete links, mm-hmm. gathering pictures. I always suggest that people do that. And I know it makes your emails ugly, but if you're if you just get an email and you're not automatically collecting in the pictures and everything, it could save you. Yeah, it's ugly. But that's one thing I do suggest to people, too, is just and there's different settings depending on the email client. 
but it's it's just to not phone home to pull those those images back. So a lot of times, different systems you can lock out, make sure the quest doesn't even happen. So and I always it, like to talk about that. And in most of the public mail platforms, whether it's I, I think I've seen it in Gmail. Um, mm-hmm. It's probably in all the Microsoft flavors. <laughs> Should be. Yep. Probably might be in Yahoo. I don't know about that one. Yahoo. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But, and yeah, there are, yeah. And it definitely does create ugly email, but in some cases, actually more, <laughs> some of the emails I get are more legible that way than w- with the images in, uh, enabled. Yeah, can just cut to the chase and see the little one word that they asked you instead of all the little fluff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no dancing monkeys, no exactly. sc- screeching owls or whatever other things. Yep. Uh, so if people want to find you on the internet, where can they find you? And let's not give them your, your super secret information. Really, it's my website is the best way to do it. And it, it's really hard to remember. It's brianselfspeaks.com. So pretty easy, actually. So if they will, if they wanted to get in touch with me, just go out to the website. I you know, probably have too much information out there for people to contact me, but that's the way to do it. That's awesome. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Pray podcast today. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Pray podcast. If you found this episode helpful, please leave a review at easypray.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Brian Self can be found at easypray.com slash 55.